my young wizards. So, you're curious about the history of Wizard 101? <laughs> well then, let's consult the Eye of History, shall we? My sister downloaded it onto our computer, and I remember my internet was really slow back then, so it took forever for it to download. Me and my siblings, we'd just be huddled around the computer, watching the progress bar of it downloading going forward, and we were super excited because it was like, it was cool, and it was, it was new, and we saw all the advertisements. Around that time, there used to be a lot of um, TV advertisements. And I remember seeing those on TV and being like, wow, this looks really cool. I just really liked the, the spell animations. I thought, as a kid, it was, it was really enjoyable. It was just something I'd never seen before at the time. My name is J. Todd Coleman. I am a game designer. The biggest game I've ever worked on is Wizard 101. That was actually a creation originally started by myself and Joseph Hall, who was my college roommate, oddly enough. And Joseph and I have been making games basically since college. Um, our first game was a game called Shadowbane that we put out in, I want to say 2003 or something like that. Uh, and then we sold that company to Ubisoft and then our next title was Wizard. So interestingly enough, the connection uh, that Joseph and I made to Ely was not at all through games. So Ely had made a decision that he wanted to get into games, I believe because his son uh, was in heavily into World of Warcraft. And because of our background with Reliant, our first company, we knew venture capitalist investors. And whenever they had anybody ask questions about the games industry, because we knew them and we were in the games industry now, they would basically connect us to them and say, hey, this person has a bunch of questions about the games industry. That's how I got connected to Ely was through a mutual friend who happened to be a venture capitalist. Um, he said, hey, I met this guy and he's interested in games. I know that you're trying to get another game started. You guys should meet. So I called him and Ely picked up and he said, well, when are you going to be in Dallas next? And I said, well, I'm probably going to come back in about three or four weeks or I could be there in 20 minutes. And I have all my information here, like I had everything with me. And he said, well, why don't you come and we'll have lunch and we'll talk about our plans. So um, Ely's plan uh, that he told me at that lunch was he wanted to create a very different type of game company. And he had been talking to a number of people, not just me, about what their pitch would be. And all of the pitches that he was hearing were very like first person shooter, heavy violence. And so, you know, he asked me, well, what kind of game are you pitching? And, and it was pretty funny because, I, you know, I pull out my little sketch pad that has all these early pictures of wizards and flying pigs and things like that. And I'm like, well, this is the game that Joseph and I want to make. It's called Wizard 101. Very quickly after that, he said, um, I like you guys and I like your pitch. So I want to say that was at an end of October, early November of like 2004. Having just come off of Shadowbane and just sold a company to Ubisoft, um, it was not a giant win for us, right? It wasn't like retirement money, but it did give us a little bit of time to kind of lick our wounds and figure out what we're going to do next. And so we were spending a lot of our time, like literally watching television and stuff. And I remember um, watching uh, episodes of Yu-Gi-Oh! and thinking that the, the battle system that they did with the card game was really cool. And I was going back and rereading a bunch of old fantasy that I hadn't read in years. And so it was kind of a conglomeration of, you know, 
part Harry Potter. That was obviously part of it. I think Joseph actually brought a big chunk of that. Uh, part Narnia, because that's that was my favorite um, uh, series growing up. And then a big chunk of it was this kind of Yu-Gi-Oh battle arena thing. And so we kind of mixed those things together and said, okay, well, what if we had a wizard school where the spells were actually these very cinematic things, kind of like Yu-Gi-Oh. And then the actual, to make it very not Harry Potter, the actual universe itself is made up of talking animals. That was kind of the three elements that we pulled together initially and once we started to kind of jam on it and pull it together it just all worked like it all just kind of snapped together in a really nice way you don't always get that in creative projects right a lot of times you're like "Ooh, I think this and this will go together and you try and crush them together and they just don't work in the case of wizard all three of the things you know the the talking animals the spell cards and the wizard school they just jived they just worked really well we were also playing a game called Toontown at the time. Toontown was really interesting. It was um, it was effectively the first time I'd seen somebody take the WoW style MMO and adapt it to a family friendly environment. And then they also had turn based combat, which was really fascinating, right? So that was a when we actually saw that working, that combined with this Yu Gi Oh idea uh, or Pokemon idea of being able to summon things, that was really really compelling to us. And when we first started, we were actually sort of, you know, modeling things out physically. We had physical cards uh, that, you know, uh, some of our artists and Todd had drawn these silly pictures on them. Basically, I drew whatever. I can't draw at all. So I would draw like a chicken or like a snowman or whatever. That's why we have like evil snowman. Why was it there a card called Evil Snowman? Because I can draw a snowman. <laughs> Snowman's just three circles. Like a lot of our early stuff, you know, the, the the sunbird, it pretty much looked like a chicken, which is why it looks a little chicken-like in the game now. Um, ninja pigs, right? I could draw a pig with a mask. Uh, so a lot of the original ideas came out of that. And then we had Legos, and we were using those to sort of visualize what we were doing. And we were in this tiny little office and we were just sort of researching, you know, software engines. I mean, we knew we were making an MMO, so it had to be able to hold the weight of a lot of people. The, uh, the other thing that we needed to make sure is that the game would run on very low-end systems. Uh, since we knew we were targeting a younger audience, you know, kids sort of would get the hand-me-down computers. So after the initial uh, cards, we did a very quick 2D prototype of combat. That is just this little 2D client and you had little 2D pictures of your guy and you had your cards and you could click on, you know, different people. And it was just a list. There was no combat circle. There were no cinematic. It was just, here's your cards, here's what they do, and you click on the guy, you know. And so we started with that. And once we started realizing, oh, this is a problem, or this was cool, and this is fun, we, you know, we had a vision that sort of proved it out a little bit about what would work and what wouldn't. Then we started planning more broadly, you know. And from there, we tried to visualize our cinematic combat. Everything was focused on that. You know, basic MMO stuff had been done before, so we didn't need to reinvent the wheel. You know, quests are quests, and you know, you move from A to B or whatever. That, that stuff's been done. But this cinematic combat was different. I remember making these huge flow charts that took up huge sections of the wall when you printed them out. And we'd, we'd tape them up and we'd follow. It was all these flow charts about different phases and what would happen and when you did this and how long it was. So the Wizard 101 team compared to a normal MMO team was absolutely tiny. I mean, for the majority of development, we were under 30 people. I want to say about 25 people. So it led to, because we were such a small kind of scrappy team, it led to some really interesting things that you can see like in Wizard, every piece of art was reused multiple times. Like we would not let any piece of art go to waste. So we would create a creature like, okay, here's a gobbler. All right, we're going to shrink him down. And we're going to make a pet gobbler. We're going to also make a mount version of a gobbler. We're going to use them in the environment. They're going to be sitting on the buildings. They're going to be eating stuff. We're going to take the concept art. We're going to actually use it as posters that you can hang in your house. We're going to take little doodle versions of them, put them in the UI. Like every piece of the buffalo must be used. We didn't have the kind of money of a World of Warcraft, right? So we had to, we had to be judicious on how we did everything we did. Todd had a very clear idea about what he wanted, and I thought that was very 
was really interesting, especially like it had some sort of real world cultural, uh, not just inspiration, but you know, so like in Krakatopia, those buildings are real buildings, you know, real structures. And so I always thought it was interesting that, you know, the kids might see these buildings in Wizard and then see them later in school or something. And remember that's where they saw it first was, was in Wizard. When we first started working on uh, the idea for the various worlds, right? We had Wizard City and we had Dragonspire were the very first two worlds that we actually mapped out. So we had the bookends of the initial story and then we filled in the, the in-between gaps, right? And I, I'm not even sure I can remember where Krakatopia necessarily came from other than my love of Indiana Jones. Marley Bone was very clearly um, a combination of Sherlock Holmes, which my mother read to me when I was a kid, and uh, Muppet Christmas Carol, because the Muppet Christmas Carol is just awesome. It's just so hilarious. I just, I love the, the, inter, the juxtaposition of animals wearing those particular period costumes that just made it really, really hilarious. And then Mushu was really a lark. I think that uh, Mushu was probably a combination of different elements, um, uh, Monkey King being one, uh, maybe some Avatar influence in there as well. But that was the original set, right? That was the original five worlds. And really we, we had some ideas beyond that, but we didn't flesh them out a whole lot. It was more just, all right, what do we, you know, we need to get these five done. And then James Nance actually, the lead designer pitched uh, Grizzleheim as a kind of a side world. And so that was the first time that we went kind of off with an offshoot that was not purely linear in the experience where you could choose to do it or not. There was concerns about the uh, combat pacing that were brought up in, in Alpha. Wizard was based off of traditional card games, but since you were limited to one card play per turn, it was difficult to get combos going without stealing your overall uh, ramp in power. And so the big change was adding zero pip spells and then creating these sort of hanging effects that you could trigger off of. And then what that meant is that each round the player had more compelling choices and decisions to make from round to round than what they had before. Because before, if everything was one pip and you were trying to get to your three pip card, you had to pass twice, which really isn't, you know, terribly compelling or exciting choice. But in this case, like, you know, you could put a blade or a trap or, you know, you could heal or you can, you know, give yourself another pip or something to kind of accelerate things. When we first started, the very first tutorial, no Malister. Like he wasn't there. Now we knew Malister was the guy. We had this secret dark stranger is what we called it, right? We had the outline of him in the little dialogue panels, but you never saw him. People wouldn't speak of him, you know? It was this thing um, and people couldn't, they didn't, we eventually revealed him, I believe in Marleybone. That's when you first saw Malister, like you would, you were chasing somebody, this stranger, and then you saw who it was. Oh, Malister. And people were like, who's Malister? Like, they didn't know who it was, right? And so we're like, man, we've got this really cool bad guy, but people don't know who it is. And they were getting confused, and the tutorial wasn't doing as well. So we just said, all right, forget this. Let's just start over, redo the tutorial, and put him right in the middle of it give you these really cool spells and you fight Malister right at the beginning you know it's like star wars when darth vader walks out immediately right like oh there's the bad guy you know like they show you the bad guy like let's do that you know and so we redid everything and you know ambrose is there and he's like oh no Malister. and so now from the very beginning we knew who he was and we knew that's who we were chasing. And the players were already engaged and involved with what was going on. And everything just worked a thousand times better. You know, people like, oh no, bad guy, let's get him. And the story just flew at that point. It just made way more sense. Beta was uh, super exciting. You know, it's nerve wracking too. 
uh, you spend all this time working and especially right at the end when you're making an MMO that last those last few months are the absolute hardest you know the 80 20 rule right so 80 percent of the work happens in the last 20 percent of the of the project right so we were playing the game constantly and getting feedback and you know making tweaks here and there just things you know we found problems ourselves we're just trying to fix them you know then you're going to let people in and you get a little nervous right we were a small company it was a small project the bar was pretty low compared to you know like the big MMOs out there. One of the great things was being a self-published company. We didn't have that external pressure from a publisher that we had to meet X date or get X things done, which was a burden of responsibility, but it was also a little bit of freedom for us to be able to say, okay, we want to launch this game and we want it to be this way and it's going to come out when it's ready. So. Uh, September 2nd, 2008 was when it was ready. And when we actually launched, um, it wasn't a traditional MMO launch where it's like, oh my God, immediately it's this giant success. It was actually kind of slow at the beginning is we kind of earned our way into it. Like the game came out and it didn't get like millions of people because it was kind of weird, uh, but it got a following and that following stuck around. And then the next month there were more people that came in and then they stuck around and it just kind of built and built. And I think it was about a year later when we hit a million registered players. There was some big milestone like that. It struck us, oh wait a second, there may be something really big here. 